Well, good evening and welcome to EdChat Interactive. My name is Mitch Weisberg and I'm the administrator or, or host tonight uh, on EdChat Interactive. Uh, we're going to be talking about strategies for teaching argumentation. And I think a lot of you who are here um, are responding to some of the emails that, that I had sent out a little bit earlier about uh, um, how important it was or it, it is to get our students to start understanding the difference between persuasive techniques and real facts and logic as opposed to mere uh, persuasion. And that's what we're going to be learning today is how to teach those skills. And I'll move on to talk about what we have coming up. Uh, I think some of you have heard of the 20% uh, time that Google has for its employees. If, if you work at Google, you can spend up to one day a week or basically 20% of your time on any project that you think will have relevance. And teachers are starting to ad adopt that in their classes. One of the, um, one of the people who, who talks about it is a person named Kevin Brookhauser. So Kevin's going to be here on March 9th. He's going to be talking about how he's deployed the 20 time project in his class, how he has talked to their teachers who have done it in their classes and uh, taking questions from you all or discussing how you all are using project-based learning in your classes as well. And then the following week on March 15th, we're going to have a, a, um, hopefully a really interesting discussion with Dave Henderson and, and Jeff Maddock, uh, Madlock. They're two teachers from Oklahoma and you can probably pick up from my accent that I'm from New York. And we're going to hopefully have a really rousing discussion on the politics of education. And that comes in really two different arenas. One is education itself is, if you think about it, it's a public, uh, it's, it's a public organization. So there's politics involved with education itself, but also as educators, uh, there's, we, we're aware of all the things that are going on in politics around us and how do we deal with our students with, that, with those politics. So we'll be talking about those issues and you'll see if we can get people from Oklahoma and New York and the rest of the US and around the world to agree on different ways of, um, of treating the politics of education. So that's what's coming up. And now we're ready for Kathy Glass. Uh, as it shows here, Kathy's written 10 books. Uh, she speaks at conferences all the time. She's an educator. Uh, she's a consultant. Uh, her most recent book is the one that's shown here. I'm going to blow it up a little bit so you can see it a little bit better for a minute. Um, it's a series on redesigning education, and the most recent one is on argumentation. And let me stop these slides and bring Kathy up. Well, welcome to EdChat Interactive. So, and you're Hello. in California. Hi, everyone. Thanks. I am in California, so it's a little earlier for me than some of you on the East Coast. And so, I'm just curious, what prompted you to write a whole book on argumentation? Well, I ended up writing a five-book series, and each of the books in the series focuses on a different um, text type and genres of writing. So I began with the fundamentals of how you redesign or design from scratch, um, how you how you approach a writing unit of instruction. And then from there, you can um, take what you have that's existing and you could, or you could critique something that's been given to you or you can write a unit from scratch. So the first one was the fundamentals of how you design curriculum around writing instruction. Then the first one's on argumentation, the next one's on narrative, then there's going to be one on informational, then one on poetry. So I'm all about giving teachers self-agency to pretty much capitalize on their own professionalism and revise and strengthen or critique um, a unit of instruction so it's theirs. So I know that you have more than 10 slides, right, <laughs> for tonight, like 70 slides. So I'm thinking that it probably would be best if I brought myself down and just let you run yes right yes okay. okay thank you very much Mitch thank you okay so we have a lot to cover today so we'll go through the slide deck he said there were a lot of slides but some of them are, are quite 
um, quick. So here's our cover slide. So um, Mitch is the one advancing the slide. So Mitch, go ahead and do the next one. Here's what I'd like to cover today, these four major points. I usually jam pack a, a webinar or a presentation because teachers or educators usually like more rather than less. So I have a lot of information to cover tonight. If we don't get to all of it, that's fine. If you're still yearning for something, you can certainly email me or call me and we can continue with the conversation. So next slide, please. So Mitch went over some ways that you can interact, and I believe in interacting with webinars or any presentation, so I encourage you to do so. Throughout the presentation, you're going to see opportunities where I'll, I'll invite you to do that. Next. OK. Next. All right, so this is just the, the foundation, so that you're really clear on what argumentation is. And you can check out this slide. Notice at the bottom there are three bullets on purposes. You don't need to have all three of these. So when you talk about argumentation, it might be to change the reader's point of view, or it could be a, to bring about some action. You don't always have to bring about some action, but there are certain topics where that would be the case. So you may not have a situation where kids are going to approach all three of these. Next. So when we talk about argumentation versus persuasion, we're talking about using logic to convince the reader of a particular position. So we're talking about evidence here. We're talking about using facts and data and anecdotes and primary source material, et cetera, to really formulate a logical argument. Persuasion deals more with the ethos or the pathos. And we're talking about Aristotle's three appeals. Now for you, those who teach opinion in fourth and fifth grade, you're not going to necessarily talk about Aristotle's appeals, but you do need to know that logic is your overriding premise when you're talking about argumentation. It has to be something logical and it has to be a debatable topic. It's not to say that you won't include some sprinkling of persuasion in there, but ultimately logic rules the day. Next. So this is just a recap of what I've just said. So essentially, you will use other, in, in certain cir circumstances, depending on your task, purpose, and audience, you might decide that you need ethos and you might decide that you need pathos. In some content areas, it dictates that you do need that. Next. Next. So here's an example. When I taught the Holocaust, I had to teach pathos because we needed to talk about Goebbels and the media and the abuse and the propaganda. So when we taught that, if I didn't teach pathos, that was a significant part of that unit, that would be negligent of me. So here's one example of how you might teach it. Next. Mitch, thank you. Here's another example. So when you talk about three of Aristotle's appeals, again, logic rules the day, but pathos and ethos you might incorporate in there. And you might do circumstances like here, this example of the Holocaust, where you end up focusing primarily on pathos and see how that is with the Allied and Axis powers and how they use propaganda. That might be a precursor to an argumentation unit. Next. Next. All right, so we're going to jump into the uh, different kind of tasks that you can ask, that you can have um, kids do for a performance assessment. And for you all that teach upper elementary, um, it will be an opinion piece, but you can modify these. But I wanted to just give you some examples of how you can have a, um, a different kind of argumentation. So it could be an essay, it could be a literary critique, could be based on all different kinds of complex text. So here's one example of how you might have kids write um, an argument from an evaluation standpoint. So this was, I believe, a fourth or a fifth or a fifth or a sixth grade task. I worked with a district, and this was out of their literature textbook. So the kids were reading this particular nonfiction piece, and based on the reading, they talked about how this particular leader um, might have the traits of somebody that would make it a good leader today or not. And so they did an argumentation essay on evaluation. You can use it across any content area. Here's an example for problem solution for a science um, unit. Okay, next. 
You can do an analysis, you can do a comparison, or you could do a cause and effect. You can sometimes begin with a guiding question, which is what I do in a lot of the different units of instruction that I do. So as you can see the analysis one here, I have the question, can photographs fuel change? So when you look uh, at the Dust Bowl and you look at those compelling pictures of people undergoing dire situations, is that photograph more compelling than words might be? So it could be an analysis that kids are doing. And it could be an analysis, of course, on the written word as well. But this happened to be photographs. I used a different kind of complex text, not your traditional written word. It could be a comparison. So they might be writing an argumentation or an opinion essay comparing um, two different people, two different complex texts in this situation with speeches or debates. Or you could have a cause and effect where they set up what is happening and what's the effect of that. This particular example is using video games, but it could be something that they pull from a novel that they're reading, um, the cause of an action that a character took and what's the effect of that. Next. So you have the, um, the, the slides that Mitch had sent to you before. So if you go back, Mitch, into the last two slides, I wanted you to think about um, a particular argumentation essay that you might craft and give you a few minutes to do that. So it could be an evaluation, a problem solution. It could be a cause and effect like the other two slides or the next slide, a comparison or an analysis. So think about what you might have your kids do based on a unit that you're having kids work on right now or something that you might do later in the year, or it could be something that you're working with a colleague on. So I'm going to give you a, a moment to do that. Thank you. OK, so when you launch an argumentation or an opinion unit, we talk about what the purposes for writing are. So when you think about the purposes for writing, what are they? Why do people write? So I do an activity with students where I brainstorm with them. And when I brainstorm, they come up with a list. So what might you write for the purpose of writing? Yeah, I'd like to encourage you to type that into the text box. So uh, so things that you might come up with. What are the purposes that, that you write? And then I'll, I'll, I'll bring the slide back up. But um, are people typed to the text box? Because again, I can't really see it. No. I okay. So. It and oh, good. Okay. Okay. So I'll bring this. I'll bring the slide back up. And what are what are some of the things that they're typing in? What did Katrina type in? So I I don't have a lot of activity. So. Okay. In terms of purposes for writing, what I do at the beginning of the lesson is I have students identify why they why they would write. So we identify the purposes for writing. So why don't you bring the slides back up and then we'll we'll move from there. So when students talk about the purposes for writing, and I give them a lot of different examples. I, I pull from complex texts that they're familiar with that they've used before. I give a lot of excerpts. Um, I have cards, and I put the kids in different groups, and there's a stack of cards in each group, and I'll differentiate them according to the complexity of the actual text, how many cards I give each group based on their readiness level and the complexity of the text. And I have them sort these different cards, which are excerpts from complex text, and they identify what the author's purpose is. So they'll have uh, maybe two or three cards in each pile. Again, it's differentiated. Sometimes I support them. So depending upon the groups, you might need an adult in the, room, in the group to help them. Uh, next slide, please, Mitch. And what you want to do is then isolate that group of cards that are meant to persuade, because these are author, author's purposes. And then when we look at those cards that are meant to persuade, then we focus on those cards for upcoming activities. Next, please. So here's a taste of what that activity would look like. Next. So take a look at this first excerpt. and. Type in the in the chat box what the purpose for this is. 
So this particular one is meant to describe and it's filled with imagery and figurative language. So as I said, I would I pull either a student sample or I pull a sample from a text that the kids have read and they're familiar with. And sometimes it's a new text where it's an excerpt that can stand alone. Next slide. Look at this one and see what the author's purpose is. Okay. So this is meant to explain. So the difference between to inform and to explain, it's just as the word states. So when you're explaining something, this particular one, you're explaining how a game works. Next. Okay. Yes, exactly. It is the persuasive one. So when you look at this one and you know it's a persuasive one, where do you find the thesis statement? What word begins the sentence of the thesis statement? Yes, Katrina, you're right. Anybody else? So smoking should be prohibited by law in all restaurants. That's the sentence that identifies the thesis. Next slide, please. So I had given you three examples of cards that I would give to students, but um, I, I have a whole host of, of different cards that I give them. And as I said to you before, you differentiate. So you determine how many cards and what level of complexity you want to give to each group. You can have groups of three. You can have groups of four. You might even have kids in pairs. And they're looking at these excerpts. And depending upon the um, grade level of your students, you'll determine how long the excerpts are and how challenging they are. But what you want kids to do is notice that there's a difference between why somebody would write. So you want to make sure that the excerpts that you pull are those that have some distinction between them. So what I had showed, showed you is the describe one had a lot of imagery and figurative language. The explain one was a game. Um, you could do um, how do you um, wash dishes. You could do how you operate um, a laptop. And then to persuade, there's something that they're trying to convince a reader of. So I have several cards, as I said, and they sort them. Then what we want to do is then we want to focus, since this unit happens to be on opinion or argumentation, then we look at those particular cards and use them going forward into a lesson. This introductory activity you can also do for really any unit of study. And if you were doing a unit on narrative, then you would have a lot on um, to entertain. Um, and to describe, you'd have all of them, but then you would focus squarely after they do this introduction on those cards that are meant to entertain. And then you talk about the characteristic elements of that genre. So this particular one is on argumentation, but this activity you can use for um, any unit. And I typically do this at the beginning of the year, because when I do it at the beginning of the year, it sets the stage for author's purpose. You might do it, um, it may not even be an introduction, maybe it's a pre-assessment. Maybe your kids are more advanced and you think they know the purposes, so you might conduct this as a pre-assessment to diagnose what, what it is that they know before you begin a unit. Okay, next slide, please. So this is an example of what I just explained, so it's a recap. So I would prepare all these cards and I would follow these four steps. And as I just mentioned, that's step number four, focus on writing whose purpose is to persuade. If I am doing this for another unit, then I wouldn't do it to persuade. I would do it for narrative or whatever. But since we're talking argumentation, I'm gearing it to that. Okay, next slide, please. 
Here's an example of one that's more sophisticated. And this is um, an argumentation essay excerpt. Okay, next. And this is one, what's the purpose of this one? You probably could skim it and figure it out pretty quickly. So go ahead and, and type in to the box if you know what, what purpose this serves. To, to inform. Okay, next. Or to explain, rather. You're explaining how to wash. Okay, so if you were going to do an introductory lesson like this, why don't you jot down some ideas and give yourself a couple minutes to figure out if you were going to do this, you could draft a lesson or think about excerpts that you might use. Where might you find the complex text to use so that you could conduct such an activity? Would you use it for an argumentation unit? I'd given you other options. Maybe you want to use it for a different unit. So take a moment to think about that and, and chat in the conversation with everybody to give us some ideas. Well, I'm wondering also if somebody would um, be interested in, in clicking that raise hand button, somebody would be interested in coming up here and just talking about their ideas with you. That might be interesting also. So sure. um, I noticed that um, a couple of you, uh, you know, Nancy and Katrina both have webcams. I think Doug might have a webcam. So if any, any of you who have webcams uh, would come up here, uh, it'd be an interesting experience to talk over with Kathy what your ideas might be for a lesson. I'm going to pull myself down. I'll, I'll get the slide up. But if, as soon as somebody raises their hand, I'll, I'll bring you up. Or even your feedback on if you would do an introductory lesson like this. Okay, Mitch, I'm going to move on because I don't think we have any raised hands. Okay, so let's talk about um, a, a thesis statement for an argument. So when you write a thesis statement for an argument, next slide, please. Here's the structure and characteristics of the whole paper. And as you can see here, I didn't specify how many paragraphs for any of these because the introduction could be one paragraph, it could be two paragraphs, same with the body. It's however many paragraphs the students need to get their point across. The counterclaim may not be its own paragraph. Maybe the counterclaim is woven into other body paragraphs. But the focus that we're going to talk about here is in the introduction, how one stakes a claim. So next slide. So what's important about a claim is that it has to be debatable. If it's not debatable with differing opinions, then it's more an informational paper because you need to have something that's debatable so there's two different sides of it because they're arguing one particular side. Next. So once you have your debatable claim, which is your thesis statement, then students support it with logical reasons, evidence, and then they need to elaborate upon the evidence that they inserted. They can't just have evidence where they quote something or paraphrase something or summarize something without elaborating on why it furthers their particular position. Next. So here's an example of a non-debatable thesis that you see here. And then two other examples of topics that are debatable. Next. So what might be a non-debatable thesis statement? You see my example that smoking is bad for people's lungs. So you can chat in the box what might be another topic that is non-debatable that would not be a candidate for a persuade or for an argumentation.
So it seems to me that some of these things might even change. Like, it, you know, you could say today that it's not subject to argumentation that the Earth um, revolves around the sun. Because, it, you know, it's just been established as fact. But, uh, but uh, 400 years ago, that could have been something that was argued, right? Well, I think it could be. I mean, you have to think about what your content area is, what your complex text is, too. So it could be across content areas like you're talking about with science, and it could be um, it could be a lot of different topics, but you have to determine what it is you want kids to demonstrate understanding of. So well, all of this argumentation is all linked to your content and what it is that you're teaching. And the, and the key is that the topic has to be something that's debatable, that there, it's something that um, different people on either side could have differing points of yes, view. Yes, precisely. Okay, so let's let's move on and talk about the structure of that thesis statement and how you might construct one. So when you develop a thesis statement, as you see here on the slide, I begin with a dependent clause, and a dependent clause sets up the argument. So when you set up the argument, when you begin that way with a subordinate or dependent clause, it prepares your reader. And then the rest of the sentence, the independent clause, asserts the position together. So when you have a complex sentence like this, it helps readers understand what it is they're going to read and what you are going to further and try and sway them to a particular position. So here are two examples that you see here. OK, next slide. So let's talk about complex sentences, because this is when you can infuse grammar into your curriculum to have them um, construct a thesis statement using a complex sentence. So next slide. So complex sentence has these two pieces, the independent clause and the dependent clause. And a lot of times, people confuse clauses with phrases. So we want kids to understand what a dependent clause is so they can set up their argument. Next slide, please. So here's one way that you can construct a complex sentence, beginning with an independent clause, which stands alone. It's a simple sentence coupled with a dependent clause. Next. Or you could do it this way, where you begin with a dependent clause. So when we develop our thesis statement, this is what I advocate, that you begin with the subordinate clause. And when you do so, it begins um, with the dependent clause followed by a comma, then your independent clause. Next. So they need to know parts of a dependent clause. And here are the three pieces. Yes, there are other words and phrases within it, but this is the core parts of a dependent clause. Next. Next. So. When we talk about a subordinating conjunction, that's the very first word or words in your dependent clause. So in this particular example, when the weather is warm, next please, here's your subordinating conjunction. Next. The subject is the weather, next. And your verb, is is next so here are your parts of a dependent clause so when they're setting up an argument they want to begin this way next so here are a list of subordinating conjunctions and what i have students do is they hold i make cards out of these they pull them out of a hat and then they volunteer dependent clause beginnings for a complex sentence next so here's an example. Next. And some kids may need you to generate a list of subjects and may need to generate a list of verbs to help with this. But when they pull out of the hat, they start um, the first two, I might provide an example and then kids get on a roll and they start creating um, examples. And you might even do an exit card after this, exit, after this activity where kids create different complex sentences beginning with dependent clauses. 
So can we just go back again, you know, because you and I were talking about um, how something can be, you know, it has to be debatable to be argu in argumentation. Couldn't, and this is a, a question that, that came up, couldn't, couldn't you make an argument for something that is not debatable? For example, you, couldn't you just say smoking is detrimental to your health and make an argument for that? Well, considering the facts pretty much support that smoking is detrimental, there probably isn't a situation where smoking would be healthy for you, then that wouldn't be a strong enough topic. It's like pollution, you know, hurts the environment, right? Yeah. That that's that's something that you can't debate. So if you let's put the um, slides back on because I have a couple examples so you could okay. see some debatable topics. And then you could see that thesis statement construction where you begin with a dependent clause. So if kids and Mitch raises a really good point, if kids do not have a strong enough topic, their papers won't be strong enough because they won't find enough evidence to support it. Next. So we're going to skip this activity. So skip the series of slides. This is checking for understanding that something is a this one, stop for one second. A lot of people get this confused with the clause. This is a prepositional phrase because it doesn't have a verb. By is your preposition, way is the object of the preposition. So go to the next slide, please. Next slide. So you see here, this has the three parts, even though is your subordinating conjunction, there's your subject he, and your verb is love. So you want to teach this sentence structure to help them. Next. Next. So when you develop a thesis statement, that's the structure you want to mimic. So I begin to teach them, as I have just showed you, the difference between a clause versus a phrase to help them and to see how having a debatable topic using this construct sets the stage for them to be successful in furthering their position so they can convince an audience. Next. So here's an example of that. Next. So then I have them write one using that pattern, which you'll see on the next slide. And they can choose a topic and they can do this in pairs. And you could try your hand at one if you'd like. And then the bottom row I always keep blank so that they can pick a topic that they might want instead of one of these that I have chosen. And the other thing that sometimes classrooms like to do is that the whole class chooses a topic like minimum wage, and then everybody writes one, and then you compare each pair, each trio, and what they've done, and then you move on to another topic. And that's another way that you can do this. Next. So then the introductory activity where what students did was they had the cards and they worked in different groups. And we bring those argument essay excerpts, and those become the highlight for this next activity. Then we go back to those cards, and they locate the thesis statement. And then once they locate the thesis, we talk about what that construct is and how it followed it, or maybe it didn't follow it, and how they might need to rewrite any of them. And then when they work on their own papers, they can rewrite their own thesis or begin to draft one. Once they collect more and more evidence, then they can come back and rewrite their thesis as well. But when you begin an argumentation paper, you do begin with evidence because kids have to research a lot to find out what their position is on a particular topic before they can write anything. Next. So once kids do write a paper and they have a draft, their first draft, so they've collected a lot of evidence, you've given them a lot of time to do research, They've gone through the writing process. They've done some pre-writing and research as part of pre-writing. They have a draft. Now that they have a draft, I'm going to share with you a revision tool that they can use. Next. So the revision tool 
is um, a companion piece to a checklist and a rubric. So each of the descriptors are aligned to what your expectations are for this paper. So for instance, what I have circled here is the first one, the opening provides a context. So when they begin their argumentation papers before they get to a thesis, they need to provide some kind of a context, whatever that is. If they're comparing a book and a movie version of something, or they are um, arguing a theme for a particular complex text, then what they need to do is provide context so the reader doesn't jump right into a thesis. Um, some papers do begin with a thesis and then they have a context um, following it. But at some point in the introduction, they do need to have that to ground readers in what it is that they're going to be reading. So a revision tool um, allows students to self-assess their papers first. And by self-assessing their papers first, they take that draft and they complete this. They look at the descriptor, and then on the right-hand side, they, it's like a prove-it-to-me sheet. They write a sentence from the intro that shows context. And if you look at the second line item, is there um, a clearly stated thesis? They write what the thesis is. Then they go into reasons, and then they go into evidence, um, uh, other, um, evidence after that, then elaboration, etc. So every major point on a rubric or a checklist is accounted for in this revision sheet. So when kids are self-assessing or peer assessing and using the sheet to do it, they can see evidence of the writer or themselves doing this. Next. So there are three possible findings that they're going to have. So when they look at each line item and it says, I provide context, or the writer has a thesis statement, sometimes they actually do, do that and they do a beautiful job of it. So they'll look at that rough draft and they'll write in whatever the thesis statement is. And if they're self-evaluating, they'll say, I'm spot on, I feel really good about this thesis statement that I wrote, and they'll write it in. Sometimes though, they look back at their paper and they say, you know, my thesis statement or my context or my evidence is really kind of weak. They'll go ahead and enter it in, but they might put it in parentheses or put an asterisk by it to say that it does need some work and I do need to go back to this because it's not as strong as I thought now that I'm really critically self-assessing my work. And sometimes they find when they self-assess that it's not even there. So there was a thesis statement on the rubric and they look for the thesis statement. They look at their paper and said, geez, I, I don't have one. A peer will also take this sheet and do the same thing. So once kids self-assess and they look at their papers and, and they um, do the revision sheet and they fill it in as best they can, and they either write it in because it's there and it's present and it's strong, or number two, they write it in with an asterisk or parentheses that they need to go back to it, or three, they gotta leave it blank because it isn't present. Then they need time to take that self-assessment information and use that to revise again and they'll have a draft. Once they have that draft, that same revision sheet, they can use, um, give it to a peer, and then the peer could take that clean revision sheet and give feedback to the writer. And again, the writer looks at it, and then they make revisions after that. They might need to go into a third draft. Next. This is another excerpt of the revision sheet. This is how it starts. The top part of this is a yes, no, because this revision sheet is more, as, a, as it's titled, for revision rather than editing. So at the beginning, when they're self-assessing and when a peer is looking at it, it's really pretty down and dirty. Are there grammar errors? Do they indent? Do they have a title? So those are the beginning parts of it. And then they can certainly use this as information to revise. But the guts of this paper is to really get into the down and dirty and look at the descriptor and put in some information in the right-hand column to give them some real information for revision. Next. This is the second page where you're looking at every key piece of that argument paper. And you want kids to take a critical look at their own paper and at peers' papers. Also, what we've used this revision sheet for is um, sometimes teachers have students bring them home and then a guardian, a parent, an older sibling can fill out this revision sheet based on a student's paper and you have some nice homeschool connection. Next. So we're, we're gonna skip through this, Mitch, because we're running out of time. So we'll just go to this. 
So we talked about the difference between argument and persuasion with the appeals of logos, ethos, and pathos. Logos is the important one for an argument, whereas persuasion relies on the other two heavily, which doesn't mean that an argument wouldn't have the other two, but it's primarily logos. When you introduce an argumentation unit or any unit, you might use the activity that I suggested where kids do a card sort for purposes of writing. And then building a thesis statement, we want to begin with a subordinate clause, and we want to make sure that the thesis is a debatable topic. And then another strategy is to use a revision tool to self-assess and to peer assess and maybe use as a homeschool connection to make sure that all the points on a rubric or a checklist, which are your instructional tools, are present in the paper. Next. So here are some resources. So for building a thesis statement, I've provided you with this. Next. So for upper elementary and even some middle school, I'm sharing with you some picture books. And these have really good text in them too. So you might use this as an introduction to your unit as well. You might use it to have kids model after they could use it as um, they could use these books as the basis for an opinion piece. You could also take a look at the um, argument that the authors use in these books and identify the elements of an opinion piece where you state an opinion and provide evidence and elaboration. Next. Here are some other examples that you can use for some lessons and units and you might choose from, from these or these might spark ideas for you. Next. So if you would like to contact me and if you have some other questions that are individual and I can help you with your unit or you need some ideas, certainly feel free to reach out to me. Um, on my website, I have downloadable resources that you might like to use. On the bottom bullet under the website, if you want to join um, Edivate, I give out free resources once a month that you might like, but there's a lot on my website as well, and you can go to my website and download those from the home page. So thank you for your time. I'm sorry about the glitches at the beginning of our webinar. I'm sorry it, it didn't load as well, but we did do a rehearsal. Now I know we need two rehearsals. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. I, I don't know what happened with the slides, well, um, but um, but anyhow, it was it was it was, it was interesting. So. Um, and you know, teachers who have followed these, what then happens to their students? Are they can they then translate the, the um, once they've learned how to write arg, you know argument arguments, are they then better to um, assess what they're reading as well? Does that you know does it spill over into other aspects? Sure, it would. Well, what's really wonderful about an opinion or an argumentation piece, whether it be an essay, a literary critique, etc., is they have to do a great deal of research on their topic and they have to dig deep and keep diving back into the complex text over and over again. So they demonstrate real understanding of a whole host of complex text. So maybe it's on a novel, like I said before, it could be a, you're, you're identifying the theme or a character's actions and how it had implications for shaping the plot or influencing other actions or how the historical setting might have impacted um, what they think and feel and their perspectives. So when they create an argumentation piece, they have to really understand their material thoroughly. If they're doing one in science or social studies and using a swath of informational material and research, then they have to really understand that in order to, number one, identify a topic, that's hard to do, collecting your evidence, to, to decide what do I want to sway people about? What opinion do I want them to have that I need to demonstrate understanding of this information and convince them in um, a very logical way? How can I do that? So it really has so many skills in an argumentation or an opinion piece because reading and writing are intrinsically connected. So they have the advantage of, of, um, of identifying from the reading the topic and then the evidence to support it. Right, and I mean, it could even go 
well, I'm thinking of current events, but 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 I was thinking even on um, the commercials that they see on te on television to be able to watch a commercial and say, oh, they're appealing to me emotionally. Um, yes. That, you know, yeah, it's yeah, not yeah. based on logic. Absolutely right, and inflammatory language and bias, right? They would have the advantage of of um, understanding all of that, all these different techniques, persuasive techniques versus argumentation techniques. So, well, that's what that's what we're hoping that the kids learn, right? Because um, yeah. we want them to um, make informed decisions and not just uh, choose something because somebody's making an emotional appeal to them. Right. So, and that whole piece about evidence that it has to be logical is critically important. So they can't just say it's because I know or because I think or because somebody said so. They have to prove it. And that's a really key piece. OK. Yeah. Well, and I think that, it, you know, in, in like, all likelihood, we'll do, an, you know, another session on writing where you'll choose probably a different type of writing and talk about how do you get the kids to uh, learn how to do explanatory writing or, or poetry or some other aspect of writing, right? Yes. Yes, we can so, do that, too. Good. So we can do okay. that. Thank you so much. Thank you okay. all for coming. All right. All right. Thank you for coming. Thank, thanks. And, and, and see you soon at another event. And uh, I hope everybody, um, everybody here and uh, listening to the recording uh, can come to a future event at www.edchat interactive. Uh, this is Mitch Weisberg, and I'm signing off. So good night.